I'm Harriet Vansvall, cardiologist and clinical trialist from Canada, and I'm delighted to be here at ESC 2025 with Michael Borger, who is the director of cardiovascular surgery in Leipzig and the chairperson of the ESC EACS guidelines for the management of valvular heart disease, which was presented. Welcome, Michael. Well, thanks very much, and thanks for the invitation to speak to you and your group today. Well, this is a huge set of guidelines, and I wonder if you could start by giving us your top three or four takeaways uh, that represent some of the new evidence that has emerged in valvular heart disease. Um, there's 28 new recommendations and 50 revised recommendations, so obviously I couldn't get them all covered in three or four uh, highlights. But I would say we certainly put more stress on um, patient-centered care and shared decision-making. We had two patient representatives, one from ESC and one from EACTS on the task force. And they gave us a lot of important feedback. And if you look at all the figures for the different valvular etiologies, you'll see the patient in the middle of the figure and how important it is that the heart team speaks with the patient in order to come up with a, uh, uh, a solution that's acceptable to everybody. Um, and we even have, for the first time that I know of, a uh, 1A indication for patient education with regards to uh, oral anticoagulation if patients are taking a mechanical heart valve, for example. So it's more patient-centered. Um, uh, we stress also the increasing importance of the heart team and heart valve centers. Uh, this has been shown in an increasing number of publications that a multidisciplinary uh, heart team improves outcomes and that these heart teams should be part of a network, including a heart valve center that has more um, uh, personnel, more different disciplines involved, including on-site uh, interventional cardiology and cardiac surgery 24-7, uh, where the complex cases ca can be uh, discussed and treated um, and uh, hopefully also with uh, better outcomes. And then a third point I would say is uh, advanced cardiac imaging. We stress the increasing role of CT and MRI. Um, and uh, the fourth point I would say is uh, trying to catch patients earlier in their disease process. So we have recommendations related to aortic insufficiency, aortic stenosis, asymptomatic aortic stenosis, asymptomatic mitral regurgitation, and also tricuspid regurgitation that quite clearly stress that um, you shouldn't wait too late in order to intervene on patients uh, because that will have downstream effects on their lifetime survival. Fantastic um, synthesis of some of the approaches that are recommended across valvular heart disease conditions. I wonder now if we could focus on the aortic valve. Can you comment on some of the new recommendations for both aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. Aortic stenosis in particular has such a high burden of disease. Perhaps we could start there. Sure. So I think the one um, change compared to the 2021 guideline document that most people are talking about is our adjustment of the age cutoff before recommending TAVI. We went from 75 down to 70, and that was based on a multiple low-risk SAVR versus TAVI trials that have included an increasing number of patients between the ages of 70 and 75. So we have more patients available for analysis, and we saw that the results for TAVI are very good. We still need more long-term data in this patient population, but we felt it was um, reassuring enough that we could at least lower that age limit. Um, but I should stress that the word tricuspid aortic valve stenosis is there because we know that TAVI results in bicuspid aortic valve stenosis patients is not quite as good. And therefore, we left that patient group out and uh, continued to recommend surgery for patients under 70 at uh, low surgical risk. So for aortic stenosis, that was, I think, one thing that a lot of people talk about. But also in the diagnostic algorithm, um, we made a, a pretty a significant change from my point of view. We put um, calcium scoring from cardiac CT at the same level as dobutamine stress echocardiography in patients with low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, saying that you know if they are move if you're moving down the algorithm, 
and uh, the CT clearly shows severe calcification, then this is uh, aortic stenosis and you don't necessarily have to proceed with a dobutamine stress echocardiography. Sure. And perhaps the recommendation that in asymptomatic patients with a severe gradient uh, and a preserved ejection fraction intervention may be reasonable if the surgical risk is low. That may also represent a change in the recommendations, would you say? Yeah, of course, there's been the two randomized trials, the two large randomized trials, early TAVR and TAVR unload, uh, that were published since the last uh, document. Um, they showed some benefit for earlier intervention in um, asymptomatic aortic stenosis. However, the task force also had some methodological issues, particularly with early TAVR, where um, part of the outcome, primary outcome, was basically one of the treatment strategies. So that's always difficult because that means half of the patients couldn't experience that outcome. Um, and therefore, we didn't feel confident with increasing the uh, recommendation up to a level one. We kept it at a 2A, but we also have this 2AA recommendation now saying that uh, early intervention is a reasonable option compared to uh, watchful waiting. And then we continued with the 2AB recommendation for certain high-risk asymptomatic aortic stenosis patients, for example, those with very high velocities across the aortic valve, where we would suggest a, an intervention. Whether it's surgery or whether it's TAVI, that's the decision of the heart team. But as you know, we also had the two uh, randomized trials, surgical trials previously for avatar and recovery, showing a benefit of surgery um, with regards to long-term outcomes in asymptomatic aortic stenosis patients. But they were both small and, and relatively underpowered studies. Sure. And patient preference, of course, in addition to the heart team deliberation. What's new in the aortic regurgitation? Aortic regurgitation has a few new uh, aspects. For one, in the diagnostic pathway, uh, this is one uh, typical of valvular disease where the uh, increased precision, precision of our Imaging assessment um, really is important where we want to stress. We want to know the severity of the lesion. We want to know the etiology and the mechanism of the lesion. Um, and we want to look for signs of cardiac damage. And in that regard, we did slightly modify one of the recommendations to include indexing of volumes. And those volumes are best measured with uh, CMR. And uh, because you do have, uh, it's been shown with smaller women, for example, uh, that if you wait for the traditional cutoffs before intervening, that that may have long-term negative consequences for them. So we want to adjust the uh, dimensions based on their body surface area, and that may result in uh, intervening at an earlier stage in the disease process, uh, fitting in with my theme that I mentioned before. Another new aspect is that we, we saw increasing experience with surgical isolated aortic valve repair. There's more and more expertise um, in this uh, uh, treatment of aortic insufficiency, but it still remains a relatively small number of centers that do this routinely. Um, but certainly in those centers with the expertise, we thought it was safe to make this a 2A recommendation for aortic valve repair. Um, and then we have a new 2B recommendation for high surgical risk patients uh, to undergo transcatheter or TAVI uh, um, treatment uh, if they are symptomatic or have signs of LV dysfunction but are not good surgical candidates. How about mitral regurgitation? Severe mitral uh, regurgitation from a primary etiology. What's new in that area? Surgery is still plays the predominant role for patients with primary regurgitation. And we even have a new 1B uh, recommendation for asymptomatic mitral regurgitation for patients that meet three of four uh, criteria, atrial fibrillation, pulmonary hypertension, uh, concomitant tricuspid regurgitation, or LA dilatation. Thank you. But if patients have three of those four, we know that their survival curve significantly decreases after intervention, and therefore we want to refer for surgery um, when those uh, three of those four appear. 
Um, we also have a new um, uh, or a higher uh, level of recommendation for tier in high-risk patients with primary mitral regurgitation that are not surgical candidates. So this is a 2A recommendation now. Previously, it was 2B. Right. And, and uh, what's the role of TIR in secondary MR in these guidelines? Well, TIR remains the um, procedure of choice for secondary MR, especially for ventricular secondary MR. But in these guidelines, we did define for the first time um, atrial secondary MR, which is an important uh, entity that has a completely different um, trajectory, uh, trajectory um, of the patient's uh, clinical course, and therefore uh, they usually have more preserved uh, left ventricular function, and uh, they also have a very different etiology than ventricular secondary MR. And therefore, we have a 2A recommendation for surgery because it can address the sometimes massive annular dilatation of the mitral valve, and oftentimes the tricuspid valve is also dilated and leaking, plus the atrial fibrillation with an ablation, plus uh, closure of the left atrial appendage. So basically everything can be addressed at once, and there is some evidence showing that surgery has very good results in those patients. TIR can also be used as a 2B recommendation uh, for those patients that are not uh, good surgical candidates. But the main message was atrial secondary MR is a very different disease than ventricular secondary MR, and for ventricular secondary MR, TIR is definitely the procedure of choice, and we now have a 1A recommendation to lower uh, heart failure rehospitalization rates and improve quality of life uh, based on a, a new third randomized trial plus a meta-analysis showing a clear benefit with regards to those outcomes uh, with TIR. Right. And we should add that all of these interventions should be offered when patients have been optimized on guideline-directed medical therapies for heart failure. In the setting of secondary MR. Correct. Is that right? Very important. Guideline-directed medical therapy has to be optimized. Um, and uh, the criteria to meet the um, anatomic and clinical criteria, we define clearly in a table um, that corresponds to those uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria from those trials. Uh, and also uh, that the patients should also have gone cardiac resynchronization therapy if indicated. Uh, before proceeding with TIR. There's been some new evidence in the area of tricuspid regurgitation. Maybe we'll end with that valve and lesion. Any new recommendations? Yeah, we refined the surgical indications in those patients that are requiring left-sided heart valve disease. We said that a 2A recommendation for concomitant tricuspid repair if the TR is moderate, or a 2B if the TR is mild, but also with annular dilatation. And then, of course, for um, uh, patients that do not require surgery, we have an um, increase in the level of recommendation for T-tier uh, based on several randomized trials for a 2AA recommendation uh, to improve uh, quality of life and reduce the risk of um, hospitalization for heart failure and to improve RV the right ventricular reverse remodeling. Uh, and those are in selected patients, and, and therefore we, we also stressed as a 1C recommendation that these patients should all undergo a multidisciplinary heart team evaluation before undergoing tricuspid valve intervention. Right. Well, we are at the end of our time together. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and these guidelines with us, a monumental document that deserves uh, reading beyond our brief discussion. But thank you so much, Michael Borger, for joining me this morning. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure. It was a long haul, a lot of work, but it was especially nice working with uh, Fabian Pratz as the co-chair and the task force was wonderful. I think we came up with a pretty good end product. Thanks very much for the invitation to speak today.